we have a complicated relationship with our bodies, don't we? I mean, we often feel too short or too tall or too thin or too plump. Our noses are too small or too big, our hair too curly or too straight. It goes on, on and on. And I know it's been true for me. I'm pretty sure that this is because of the messages we've received and we've been receiving them for centuries. The messages that were impacting Quinn in our story for all ages earlier, the messages that we are not made of beautiful star stuff. It goes way back. Plato believed that the mind was separate from the body and he didn't trust sensory information because he thought it led to confusing reality with imagination. During the age of enlightenment, humans understood themselves as rational beings first. And they defined their bodies from that perspective. The body was something external, separate, controlled by the mind. For Descartes, the body was another substance. For Kant, it was animal-like, something that had to be overcome and controlled. And it's not just the philosophers who have contributed to negative thoughts about the body. Throughout the East and the West, and throughout the ages, people have tried to find God, salvation, or enlightenment by denying the body, denying the senses and the pleasures we get through those senses, denying sexuality. And religious folks, even inflate, some of them, even inflicted pain on themselves to weaken or punish their bodies. I mean, even Sting told us that we are spirits in a material world. So we have gotten the messages that the mind and the body are separate, the body's not good, and the mind is the boss. George Lakoff is an American cognitive linguist who studies sociopolitical issues and embodiment. And he said this, progressives are still living in the world of Descartes and the Enlightenment, a niche world governed by the rules of logic. Denark said, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. But Lakoff says, but we're embodied creatures. Our beings are real. Our thoughts are chemical in nature and occur within the confines of the physical body. We are not 100% rational beings. Now Lakoff goes on. He says, if you're gonna craft a message that can reach people who disagree with you, you have to understand their subconscious worldview, their values, and all of that lives in their bodies. Progressives focus instead on rationality, facts, and policies. And as a result, they in general are ineffective at making their points known. Man, when I read that, it stung. It's interesting, isn't it? I'm guilty. If we believe our minds are the boss, communication isn't our only problem. Learning becomes a problem when it focuses just on the brain. The exercises we did earlier with the children and youth come from a neurophysiologist who found that the body is as important as the brain when teaching students. And her whole book is about incorporating body movement in the classroom. Healing becomes a problem when it focuses on just the mind or just talking using words. Bezel van der Kolk wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And he said, when something happens in our lives that's not good, when it's oppressive, painful, traumatic, we tend to shut down our emotions. And when we do that, they end up showing up in our internal organs. They show up in our abdomen, our bellies, our intestines. He's done the research and so have many others. Our emotions show up in the form of autoimmune disorders, skeletal, skeletal muscular problems. The body literally keeps the score of our emotions. Now, based on his research, van der Kolk asserts that healing depends on having a friendly relationship with your body. It depends on becoming familiar with and befriending 
especially the sensations in your body. The sensations, is it, is the sensation tense? Is it fuzzy? Is it tight? Is it constricted? And then he says, we've got to use our bodies to metabolize the pain, metabolize it. Now his book is full of science and it will thrill your mind if you read it. But today I wanna to focus actually on the embodied practices he recommends for metabolizing our pain, laying our burdens down. In one of his studies, 10 weeks of yoga markedly reduced the symptoms of PTSD of patients who had failed to respond to any kind of medication or any other treatment. Other practices like Tai Chi are good too. His research found that breathing, chanting, singing, clapping, drumming, and other rhythmic practices train our arousal system and help us metabolize pain. Those are things we do in worship, clapping, singing, drumming. That's fun. I think they're spiritual practices. The other thing that was interesting is theater. Participating in theater is proven to help our bodies lay our burdens down. EMDR, some of you may be familiar with that, um, is a great tool for releasing pain. And neurofeedback is another practice used in his studies. When I was the minister in Boulder, a specialist in neurofeedback came to worship one Sunday. And we had it planned ahead, but she hooked me up to the feedback, the neurofeedback equipment, and the whole congregation could see my brain up on the projector. She did a few things to make me jump and everyone could see my brain react. And then she had me breathe deeply, slowly, and my brain completely shifted right there on the screen. It worked. Vanderkolk says that if we're experiencing physical ailments, processing past events, or feeling stressed in anxious moments, we can turn to embodied practices to help us lay our burdens down. We can focus on and listen to our bodies in order to heal. Two other leaders in the field of embodied practice are Stacey Haynes. She started a group called Generative somatics, and Resma Menicum, who wrote the book, My Grandmother's Hands. And I know some of you in Wellspring have, have been working with that book this year. They both teach us how our bodies are wired to process pain and trauma, but our bodies are also wired for resilience. Now, resilience is the capacity to bounce back after during and after threatening, oppressive, or traumatic experiences. They look though, these two look at not just personal experiences, but also historical, societal, institutional, and collective instances of pain and trauma that impact us all. Let's face it, we've had some of that going on lately, haven't we? These last few weeks, I mean, we've already mentioned the shooting that happened in Uvalde with all those precious children. And of course, we know that the Buffalo shooting was racially motivated. And then the Taiwanese church shooting, um, you know, that was politically mo motivated. Of course, we're grieving, we're furious, we're confused. These places are supposed to be safe. Grocery stores, schools, churches, racism in itself is a historic systemic trauma that happens and affects us all. By the way, trauma, Resma defines it as anything that happens that's too much, too fast, that we can't process. Okay, mix in other things that are going on in the world. I mean, I hate to be a downer, but we might as well just name it. Climate crisis that's manifesting in wildfires. So many of us have been impacted. The war in Ukraine, a baby formula shortage, the stock market, inflation, the prices of gas, there are others and there are many that are not good. So what do we do with all that? 
I mean, I sat on Wednesday morning with my phone in my hands after the shooting at Robb Elementary. And I thought with my mind, what should I post on Facebook and Instagram? I felt this urgency and need to do something to make a point to say something. But I also felt exhausted, depressed, and disgusted. And I remembered George Lakoff. If I use my mind and all the words that come from it, I probably won't make a decent point anyway. So I decided to turn to my body. All that shock and frustration and confusion was living right in my belly. Is what it felt like. Rumbly, tense, tight. I mean, I know we're wired for resilience evolutionarily, but it is hard to remember that. And we have to actually build our muscles for resilience. So I felt the practices, I felt the tension first, and then I began to practice what Stacey Haynes and Reza, Reza Menachem have taught me. First of all, pause. I took a two-day class with Resma. He said pause probably, I don't know, a thousand times. Pause. The minute anyone wanted to say anything, pause. He'd say pause. In order to stay grounded and settled, in order to metabolize our pain, we have to pause. That's the first step. Breathe. Join me if you're willing. Breathe in. Let it come. Breathe in and hold it for four counts. And let it go. So we pause. And we breathe. And then we can reestablish re safety belonging and dignity. And that is what Stacey Haynes says we need in order to be resilient. We need to feel safe, like we belong, and we have to remember that we have dignity. And she leads us through a practice that she calls centering. It doesn't mean center, breathe, so you can calm down and stick your head in the sand and spiritually bypass all this pain, no. The practice of centering is so that we can be present with what's going on. Then we'll metabolize it in a minute. So join me if you're willing in a centering practice. Okay, the first step is, remember you've paused, you've been breathing. Now drop your attention to an inch below your belly button. That's your center of gravity when you're standing. You can stand if you'd like, but you're at home, I know. Okay, from that place, we're gonna, we're gonna center in three dimensions and form a circle all around us, okay? So the first dimension is length. Imagine that there is a bubble 360 degrees around you and just imagine it getting taller and you, are getting taller. You might feel your spine straightening. You might let your chin even out a little bit. Settle your weight down and lengthen up. Feel your whole body growing and that whole big circle around you is growing taller. You are centered in your dignity, your inherent worth in dignity. So just feel yourself as you're lengthening. This is your sense of dignity. And you, when you feel it in yourself, it's hard to conjure up in our minds. Oh, I have worth, I have dignity. Actually, get taller and you can feel your dignity. You can feel our first principle of inherent worth and dignity, and you can start to see it in others. So you're centering in length and getting taller. Next, width. The second dimension is width. Fill out into the fullness of your shoulders, your hips, really widen out. You might even hold your hands out like I am. I mean, we tend to curl up, right? We're at our computers, we're like this. Mm. 
you're tall, you're wide. Might even stretch your legs out, wiggle your hips. Okay, this second dimension is your belonging. You belong. So center in your sense of connection physically to all your people, to this church, and to the earth, to the natural world. Belonging. You're tall, you're wide, and now we're going to grow in depth, front to back. This is the third dimension. So let's start with the back. You can even just feel the clothes on your back. If you're standing, feel free to stand. You could feel the back of your legs, the back of your knees. If you're sitting, feel the back of your legs. This is connected to your history, to your skills, and to everyone who's got your back, your ancestors. So we're, we're connecting to a sense of time. And as you might imagine, the front of you is connected to the sense of, of future. So tune into the front of your body, your heart, your belly, being connected to the future and what we care about and knowing that there is a future. All right, so you're tall in your dignity, you're wide in your sense of belonging and connection. You're deep with all your history and skills and all that cushion back there. And then you've got the future ahead of you. Now, sometimes I find that I get small and forget that I have inherent worth and dignity. I get folded in and forget that I'm not connected, that I think I'm not connected. And sometimes I try to get too far in the future, all up in your face. And sometimes I get too far in the past and think, oh, nothing works. So the trick with centering is to stay in the center. Stay in the center. Now, from here, Resma Menicum teaches what he calls his four somat cultural somatic toys. He says tools just sound like a lot of work. Toys are fun. So from this centered place, we're tall, we're wide, we're deep. Now we're going to ground. This is a Resma practice. So feel your feet beneath you. If you're standing, really feel your feet. If you're sitting, feel the ground beneath you. And you could even imagine that roots are growing out of your feet. We are in this moment. We are here. In this moment, in the present. Feel that. Feel if your body feels a little more weighted down. You're big. You're in this big circle. And now you're grounded like a tree. Okay, from here, the second practice is orientation. Look, just orient in your space. There is something that happens to the vagus nerve when we turn and look at all the exits. Look at the windows. Look behind you. Look to your left now, whatever direction you want to. And really orient yourself. This does something to our brains physically. You are here. You are safe in this moment. Next is support. So bring something to mind again. Maybe it's not the greatest, like me on Wednesday morning after that shooting at Rob Elementary, the belly, oh, all scrunched and grumbly. Okay. Bring something to mind, could be anything. Might be an argument you had with a partner or a family member. Anything that's thrown you off this week. Could be up here in the chest, could be in the throat, could be in the necks and shoulders. Where is it and what sensation are you feeling? And then just hover your hand over that spot.
support. Support your body. Don't rub it too hard. Just kind of your heart's pounding. Mm -hmm. Just, yep, just do that. And then, I know this is sounding a little weird, but we're going to hum. It's a stretch. But Resma says the act of humming. So hold your hands where your tension is, and we're just going to hum. We're on mute, thank goodness. You see me, I'm rocking because that's the next thing. The fourth toy is movement that mimics the womb. So you can keep humming and rock front to back. You can also sway right to left. I mean, these seem silly, but the research shows it absolutely helps us. And let me tell you, Wednesday morning when I did this, I could feel my grief. Yep. And I could feel it moving. And I could feel the sensation in my belly relaxing a little bit. And then I could move to thinking, oh, what do I need to do? And honestly, I... I couldn't make a post yet on Facebook. I had to go outside and pound it out and take a walk. And then I could post about grief and how grief lives in our bodies and how we have to grieve together before we can organize together. When we do these practices, we become settled our bodies settled, and then we get settled as a community. Just before the pandemic, I spent 14 hours one day at the state capitol one night as a chaplain to people who were testifying against the hate of slate. It was oppressive LGBTQ legislation. And after one trans person testified, I met her in the hallway outside of the committee room. And she was breathing fast and shallowly. And I asked her if she would like to rock. And she smiled and she said, yes, I would like to walk, rock. And we began to rock together. And she said, I think I need to wiggle. And so she just started to wiggle. I mean, it had been really hard on her to testify. And then she showed me three body practices that have helped her release stress and oppression in her body, giving herself a hug, touching her elbows to her knees one at a time. And then guess what the last one was? It was the hookups like we did with the kids earlier when they were here. So check in with yourself now. Breathe again if you'd like. Rock a little bit. From a settled place, we can tap into resilience, the ability to bounce back, the ability then to discern what's next. We are not 100% rational beings. We can thank our minds for all they do for us and all the times that they've been boss. But in these times, it is unlikely that they'll see us all the way through. Our bodies are our allies, ready to help us learn, help our kids learn, ready to help us heal, and ready to help us build resilience. I hope you will try all of this at home. May it be so.